Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mara Papil, and I am the Director of Student Support Services. It's nice to see you all. Um, I just want to recognize the superintendent, Kevin Mulvey is here, Assistant Superintendent, Aaron Perkins, uh, Director, Larry Tagliari is here, um, and newly elected <laughs> Courtney Perdios to the school committee. So thank you so much. And I see some of my counselors here, so I appreciate the support. Um, we are so lucky to have Dr. Watson with us today. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Watson at an SEL conference that was through Harvard Medical School. Um, and she was a presenter there, and she um, you know, kind of talked about her platform um, and just her way of engaging students and creating safe space at school, um, the importance of the relationship. And um, I just felt like she's really got something here. And I was spot on, I have to say, um, you know, that we were able to get Dr. Watson's programming in our schools. It's a district rollout. So your students, if you have students in Quincy Public Schools, um, they will have a social emotional learning through um, the Open Parachute platform, which Dr. Um, Watson created. So we're thrilled to have her. We had her here yesterday for our educators doing sessions for the um, day-long professional development. The feedback was amazing. Um, and so we feel like it's such a gift to have her here in person. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Watson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for turning out tonight. I know you all have busy schedules, so I really appreciate you being here. Um, so a little bit about my background. I am a clinical psychologist, so I've worked individually with families and young people for a long time. But then I did a PhD in school bullying interventions, and I've also been developing programs for schools for about 20 years in a few different countries. I'm originally Canadian. You can probably hear my accent at some point. <laughs> and I lived in Australia for a while, so it's a bit confused. Um, <laughs> But I, I really am passionate about working in schools and with parents and with teachers to really help bring psychological skills out of the therapy room because that's a, such a small space and so few people can access that necessarily regularly and it is something that even if you are accessing it, it's once a week max. So my whole mission is to empower you as parents and to empower schools with the tools that you need to really help your children thrive um, in a really, hopefully, simple and structured way. So the goal is that you walk out of here with some tangible things that you can use and hopefully a little bit more confidence and understanding of what you can do um, to help support your child in, in addition to all of the things that you're already doing. So we have one little technical thing. My computer would be here normally, but it's, it's over there. <laughs> So I might just have to awkwardly look at the slides a little bit, so sorry. <laughs> all right, so jumping in, all right, pointing there. <laughs> Great, jumping in. So when we think about resilience, that's what we're thinking about. How do you help your child become resilient? And it's something that you hear a lot, it's a word that you hear a lot, and I wanna kind of simplify it a little bit in terms of what does that actually mean? So a good place to start is thinking about what gets in the way of resilience. What would happen in your child's life to cause a lack of resilience? And this applies to us as well. Everything that we talk about for young people also applies to us. What happens in our own lives? So stress and overwhelm, of course, that is a huge factor in the lives of young people. There's so many things that are going on in their lives and there's so many things that happen at school that become quite stressful. Perfectionism. So a lot of young people, when they're under that school pressure, really strive to be perfect. And there's great things about striving to, to do well. And then there's a shadow side of that pressure that they put on themselves, and that can then actually counteract what we're hoping for in terms of them living up to their fullest potential. Then there's the flip side, which is low motivation and apathy. So not striving. And oftentimes, perfectionism and low motivation actually come from the same place. There's a fear of, I'm not good enough, and so either we quit or we really push ourselves too hard. And then linked to that are low self-esteem and negative thoughts, and that is really, really common for so many young people because growing up is hard. 
And it's really hard to not compare yourself to other people, especially in the world of social media. And there's a lot of challenging things that, that we go through when you're we're young. And our bodies are changing and our minds are changing. So it's really normal for young people to go through phases where they struggle with the thoughts that they have about themselves. We, I know I went through that when I was younger, and a lot of people go through that. Most people go through that. And then, of course, there's challenges. Challenges in the family, challenges in peer groups, people being unkind, challenges online. And so the thing that I want to highlight with all of this is that it's not so much the challenges that your kids go through that lead to a lack of resilience. It's more how we respond to them, which is good news because we can't control what happens in our kids' lives. We can't control the things that they face, but we can help and support in how they're responding to them. So that's all resilience is, is helping to learn different tools and ways of responding to the challenges that life throws at us. So that's what I'm gonna help you with tonight. So there's an added layer to this, and I know we're all sick of hearing about COVID <laughs> because it happened a while ago and we're hoping that we don't have to deal with it again, but it is important to bring up in a parenting context because on one level or another, your children will have gone through it. Maybe they will have been impacted a lot, maybe just a little bit, but even if they weren't personally impacted by lockdowns, by challenges of, of job loss or anything like that, they will have at least heard of the things happening in the world around them. And there's a lot of fear in our world right now. There's a lot of things in the media that are scary. And there were things that happened during COVID that were out of our control. And that was a significant experience for a young person to know that there might be a situation where jobs are scarce to know that there might be a situation where you can't go somewhere in the world that you want to go. There might be a situation where people lose their lives. These are really intense things. And so young people's minds have been shaped a little bit by that. And so not that we have to think about it all the time, but it is important to recognize that there's this added layer that we didn't go through as kids that our kids have faced. So one element is if your child was home during COVID and had a period of time where they weren't at school or they were doing online learning, then there is, and even if that wasn't a huge factor, there would have been less social interaction. So there's a period of time, there's a lot less going on play dates, a lot less going to social situations. And so that simply means that there was less practice with social skills. And so that plays a role. Loneliness could have been a factor with that less social interaction. And then with loss of control and perceiving loss of control, it's really normal and natural to have a, a desire for more control. So we get more anxious. And again, this is true for all of us as adults as well as it is for young people. And then of course, the more we're online, the more online influences us. So that's just the context. You know all this. You've seen what is your children are facing. You know the specific context. But this is the, the sort of layer of, of what a lot of young people face and go through. So what do we do about this? How can you help in the face of the challenges that your child faces? So the important thing to remember is that no matter what you're seeing in your child, what, what they're facing, what they're struggling with, what you see manifesting, what you see coming to the surface, how they're reacting, it's always bro broken down into a simple pattern. No matter what it is, it always starts with a feeling. So whether your child is acting out, whether your child is anxious, whether your child is shutting down, whether your child struggles to interact, whether your child is always gone and never interacts with you, whatever you see happening, it always starts with a feeling. So something hard happens and they feel something. Then there's a thought about that feeling. So maybe something happens in a peer group at school, so I start to feel sad. Then my thought might be, people don't like me. That's a really common thing to think when we're sad. I think that thought a lot when I'm sad. <laughs> Nobody likes me. <laughs> 
then we react. When we have a thought that's a negative thought, we have a reaction. So maybe your child comes home and they're having, they had that sad feeling, they start thinking no one likes them, so they go into the room and they slam the door and they come home. That's a reaction. Now, the first three are natural and they happen and we don't need to worry about them too much because we're human. We can keep learning how to shift our reactions and responses, but it's really hard to do that. So the first thing to remember is that's okay. It's okay that we sometimes react in ways that are not that helpful. But th the problem comes when it's a pattern. So every single day, your child comes home and goes into the room and slams the door. Because then what we can infer from a pattern is that there's probably a consistent negative thought going on in their mind. And that's probably a response to a consistent feeling that they're feeling. And that probably means that there's something consistently hard that they're facing. So the thing to be aware of is just the patterns. And that's the biggest and best thing that you can do when you're supporting your child is pay attention. What are the patterns? How often are these things happening? In what context are they happening? If we can zoom out and see these patterns, there's so much information that we can gather for how to help young people, how to help your children. So parents often ask me, what's a red flag? How do I know if this is a real problem or something serious or something that I need to do something about or pay attention to? And I would say that anything that causes harm and is happening consistently as a pattern, that's something to watch out for. Now, that doesn't mean in any way that there's something wrong with your child at all. It just means that they're caught in an unhelpful pattern because of something hard. And that's a really important thing because at the end of the day, every child is amazing and unique and wonderful. And no matter what it is that's happening for them, the essence of them is not what their reactions are. And so what we all want to do and what you do every day is look through those reactions and try to figure out, okay, why are they responding this way? What is the pattern? And how can I help them shift that so that I can bring forward that amazing kid that I know is there? That's the goal. So how do we do that? So there's four simple steps that I want to take you through that are really focused on building resilience, building lasting resilience and really helping in the moment as well as a building block in the long term for your child. So I've put this into a model, which I call the tree model, just to help kind of understand what we're talking about here. So if we think of growing a tree, we start with the soil, the dirt. That's where the seed grows from. We need that dirt in order for anything to grow. But it's messy and it's dirty and it's not that pleasant. And that's a little bit like the first step, which is the trigger. So in our culture, we do a lot to avoid feelings. We avoid triggers, we avoid hard things because it's uncomfortable. And there's so many things that have been created in our world to help us get away from our feelings. Devices, distractions, and it makes it harder and harder for young people to learn how to cope with feelings. Because if we're avoiding feelings and we're getting rid of feelings, we're never learning how to deal with feelings. And feelings are, in essence, physical sensations. They're information that our body is giving us about what's happening around us. So remember, every challenging pattern comes from a feeling because of something hard. So the answer is not to get rid of that sad feeling, but to learn and to teach young people how to listen to that feeling. Oh, I'm feeling sad. Why am I feeling sad? I'm feeling sad because someone said something mean to me. Okay. If I can know that and understand that, then maybe I can do something to help myself with that. Maybe I can talk to someone about it. Maybe I can set a boundary with that friend. 
maybe I can do something to help myself in that situation. So our feelings are so important, they're the guide. So one of the most helpful things you can teach your child is how to sit with their feelings and listen to their feelings. So I want to do a little exercise to make that a little bit more practical for you because that's a lot of words. What does that mean to sit with and cope with your feelings? What does that mean? So if you feel comfortable, I'm going to do a little just mindfulness practice where you're just doing a little um, closing of your eyes and you're imagining something. And we're imagining something a little bit unpleasant as a morning. And there's a purpose for that because we're practicing what it feels like to go towards a feeling that we typically avoid. So that's the purpose of it. So if you feel comfortable, I encourage you to just close your eyes for a minute and I'll just take you through this exercise. Beautiful, okay. So I want you to imagine a situation that causes you to feel something unpleasant, a strong, unpleasant emotion. So maybe sadness, maybe anger, maybe shame, maybe loneliness, maybe fear. And I want you to imagine this situation in your mind and really bring it forward. And think about this situation. And imagine that it's happening right now. What do you remember about this? Or what do you think about this? That brings up this strong feeling. Do you have thoughts that come up? Do you have memories of interactions? See if you can really bring it forward and let yourself just imagine it for a little bit. Now I want you to see if you can feel your emotion in your body. Now, some of you might feel emotions very strongly in your body. Just be gentle with yourself if that's the case. You also might not feel anything physical at all. That's completely fine. Just use your imagination. It's just as powerful. So see if you can locate a place where this feeling is particularly intense. Maybe your chest is tight. Maybe it feels like there's a weight on your shoulders. Maybe your stomach is in a knot. Now we're just going to pay attention to this feeling for a moment. I want you to see if you can give this feeling a color. If it was a color, what color would it be? And what shape would it be? And what size? Does it have an imagery associated with it? Like a storm cloud or an actual physical weight on you? See if you can just Sit with this feeling in your body. Keep breathing in and out. And imagine that no matter how intense this feeling is, there's still air coming in and out of your body. You're still solid. You're still breathing. Now I want you to see if you can find a place in your body that feels calm and grounded. Somewhere that doesn't feel this intense emotion. Maybe your hands, maybe your feet. I want you to picture this emotion. What color would it be? What shape would it be? How big is it?
Does it have imagery associated with it? Like a warm bath or the sun coming out? Now I want you to notice both of these sensations in your body at the same time. An unpleasant one and a pleasant one. And just see if you can feel them both without judging one as good and one as bad. Just two sensations in your body. You're strong enough to hold both of them. Just see if you can notice them both and notice what happens in your mind. If you want to resist, if it feels uncomfortable, if it feels joyful, there's no right or wrong. Just notice how you feel in your body sitting with these emotions. Okay, I you to just take another couple of deep breaths. When you're ready, you can let go of that visualization and you can slowly open your eyes. Thank you for doing that with me. That can be intense, can be very dislikable. You might have been thinking how much you hated me that whole time. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. You might have felt a relief in that. Does anyone want to share a couple of words about that experience, good or bad? No problem if you don't. I'll share what happened to me when I first started doing those kinds of images or trying to get into my body. I hated it. <laughs> and I, I couldn't do it. It was so intense. Like my mind was racing so much. I actually couldn't feel into my body. It took me a very long time. Because for me in my life, one of my coping strategies, based on the things that I went through when I was younger, was to cut off from my emotions. So I became really good at never seeming sad, never really even feeling sad, but I also just didn't really feel anything. So you might have had that experience. You might have not felt anything. You might have felt really overwhelmed. When I started feeling, then I started get, getting really overwhelmed. And I would do something like that and it would just rush over me. And that's why I started that pattern of blocking things out. So when you think about your child and you think about their reactions, think about the temper tantrums they have or the thing that they do when you go, oh, why are you not thinking logically right now? What is happening for them is exactly whatever happened for you in that exercise, but their version of it. So they are feeling a strong emotion. And their mind imagines that that emotion is going to last forever because that's what happens when we're in a strong emotion. We actually lose the ability to connect to the front part of our brain, which is the rational thinking part of the brain. And the back part of the brain takes over which is our animal instinct. So there is no logic. This is why you can't reason with anyone who's having a temper tantrum, however old they are. <laughs> we get taken over. So our mind thinks it's going to last forever. But what you just experienced in that exercise and why it's so powerful to just take a couple of minutes to sit with yourself and sit with your feelings, even when it's not pleasant, even when we don't want to, is that you are training your brain to understand that emotions come and they reach a crescendo and then they pass. But we don't remember that. It's a training, it's a practice. And so the number one tool of resilience that you want to teach your children is how to sit with that wave of emotion when it rises and not act until it passes. Because every bad decision we make happens in the rising of that emotion. Because we panic, we want to get away from it, we don't like it, and that's when we do things that are harmful to ourselves and to others. That's when we snap at people, that's when we yell, that's when we throw things, that's when we go into addictive patterns, that's when we go into depressive patterns, that's when we go into anxious patterns. It all comes down to a feeling that I don't know how to cope with, 
And so I'm gonna react instead of knowing that I can sit with this, wait till it passes, and then I have a whole new perspective on what's real and what's not real. So that is the first tool. So we wanna teach that relationship to emotions. Not reacting and not suppressing. So that's really common to misunderstand emotional expression. So when we see a big emotional outburst, that's not actually sitting with our emotions. That's reacting to our emotions. But equally, if we're not doing anything, we're perfectly, perfectly calm, that is often because we're not connecting to them. So we have to find that middle ground where we feel, we feel deeply, we care about things, but we're not reacting and spitting our emotions onto other people. That's the goal. So what kind of language can you use? How can you encourage this? Simple things and phrases like, I can see this is hard for you. So if your child is stressed about something, challenge, um, challenged about something, reacting in a certain way, starting a conversation with a language like this is very, very powerful. It seems very simple, but it changes the tone. Because a lot of the times what we want to do is jump in to fix it. Here's the suggestion. Why don't you try this? That's our natural instinct. But if we first stop, and start with this simple understanding of they're feeling something. Let me help them identify that they're feeling something so that they can sit with it long enough and understand how to relate to it so that we're not bulldozing over that feeling. Talking about your own feelings, especially if you're someone who doesn't express your feelings a lot, which is true for a lot of us. If you don't talk about your feelings a lot, then try to do it with your kids. Bring it up, you know? And it can be, it doesn't have to be in a, a moment of distress. It's actually better when it's not in a moment of distress. But simply saying things like, you know, today was a pretty stressful day and I felt a little bit down about it. That's it, just a simple thing like that. It doesn't have to be a drama, but you're just showing your child that you do have feelings and you th feel those feelings a lot. It's really important that kids have that normalization because they don't know what's going on inside of us and they might look at you and think, if you're not someone that expresses emotions in a big way that much, they might think, oh, they don't feel anything. They don't feel the way I do and this is a really common thing that kids feel. I'm the only one who feels that way. It's one of the biggest statements I hear from young people. I feel this way, nobody understands me. And a lot of the times when I worked with kids, they would say, no, one of my parents, when we talk about parents, they'd say, oh, they don't, they don't feel these kinds of things. And it's a shock to them to realize, yeah, your parents feel sad sometimes. They feel overwhelmed sometimes. And so just having that open dialogue is really, really powerful. And just validating that it's okay they feel that way. And remembering you can validate their feeling without validating their behavior. It's a really important distinction. So if they're doing something that's really not helpful, you know, their sibling took something of theirs and they start yelling at them and throwing something at them. It's not okay to yell and throw, absolutely, but you can still validate the feeling. It makes sense you would feel frustrated and upset and violated that your sibling took that from you. That makes sense. Helping them see that you get their feeling means that when you deliver the consequence, it doesn't come as such a blow to them. You don't understand me. Well, yeah, I do understand you. I get it, and I hear where you're coming from, and that makes sense, and we don't hit, and let's talk about that for a second. But you have to start with the understanding. I get it. I get why you did it. That's really important. Because if they don't hear that from their parents, what ends up happening, and from anyone really, we need to all do that, not just parents, if they don't hear that validation of their feeling, they end up thinking, I'm a bad kid. Not, I'm a good kid and I did a bad thing, but I'm a bad kid. And we don't mean for that to happen. We're not saying you're a bad kid. But if I did something wrong 
and my parent is frustrated with me, I know I did something wrong, but I can't separate in my young mind the difference between being wrong and doing wrong. So that's the job of us. We have to remind them, you're a great kid, and I know why you felt that way, and I know why you did that, and we want to learn to make different choices. So the big goal that you're trying to, to figure out here when you're thinking about a childhood behavior pattern or a teenage behavior pattern is trying to think about the feeling that they're trying to avoid. Because if you really simplify it and you boil it down, any reaction, any mental health challenge, anything that we do that's unhelpful is something that we're trying to avoid a feeling. That's what we're trying to do. If we are always on our phone, we're probably trying to avoid the feeling of loneliness or boredom. If we're yelling at someone, we're maybe trying to avoid the feeling of shame or sadness because of something that's happened. Whatever we're doing that's unhelpful, we're trying to avoid a feeling. And so if you come at it from that perspective and you just have that thought, okay, they're doing this thing, what feeling are they trying to get away from? that will shape the way you respond in a really, really helpful way. And the most important thing is that you're teaching them the skills, you'll be coming at it from that perspective, to teach them the skills of how to make a different choice. Because if we don't teach kids how to deal with their feelings, they won't know how to make a different choice. They don't learn only through consequences. They do learn through consequences, but we also need to learn through skill building. So that's what we're doing here. Perfect, okay, so once we've explored the trigger and sat with the feeling, we then move on to the roots of the tree, the reflection. So the more we reflect, the deeper and wider and stronger our root base is. This is the most important thing when we're thinking about resilience. We have to have the ability to recognize what we're doing, why we're doing it, because if we can't see it, we can't change it. So this strategy of reflection is really, really helpful and important. So how can you do this? How can you help your child learn to reflect? It's a really big skill when you break it down. If they're doing something unhelpful, you can see it, but how do you help them start to critically think about it, identify it? So, there we go. So asking the question, what do you notice, is a very, very powerful question. Be curious with your child. What do you notice about your friendships? How do you feel around that friend versus around that friend? What do you notice when you sit down to study? Are you focused? Are you not focused? Really just having them start to pay attention, because paying attention to the things around them will get them to start to understand what's happening within them a lot more clearly. Helping them understand that it's okay to not be perfect. This is really important. Most kids put so much pressure on themselves. And so reminding them that the goal is not perfection. The goal is the doing the best that they can do. And that can be striving to greatness. But if they're striving for perfection, they're always going to come up short, and that's going to catch up with them. Asking the question if they are feeling a certain way, if they're down, if they're frustrated, do you often feel like this? Helping them identify where the pattern lies. And talking about your own patterns. So again, coming back to the best way that we can teach young people about these kinds of skills is through role modeling. So if we are openly talking about the patterns that we fall into, no matter how embarrassing they are, the more, the easier it will be for children to be able to do that too. But if we don't want to talk about our patterns, it's pretty hard for them to start identifying their own. So we're going to do another little task here. I'm going to go first. So I'm going to talk about a pattern that I get into, a situation of intense intensity in my home, which is doing the dishes. So in my home, 
I am a very quick dishwasher, but I am not very thorough. <laughs> so whereas my partner, he is very thorough. And so when he comes in and he sees that there are dishes with food on them, <laughs> which does happen, um, he gets annoyed. So he'll make a comment, maybe a snide remark. And for me, that's a big stressor because I don't like that. <laughs> I have a reaction to it. Um, and so for me, that's the stressor. So first we identify what is the cause of my stress? What's happening? Then remember, everything comes to a thought. What is my thought? Now, my first thought is he's a jerk. <laughs> but my second thought is I'm not good enough. That's where my mind goes. That's why I have such a big reaction, because I have a paradigm which I built when I was young for a lot of different reasons, one of which being I have an older brother who is always better than me at everything and telling me what to do. So I hate it when people tell me what to do. And my mind immediately goes to, I'm not good enough. I have to be better, because I struggle with, with being a perfectionist. Although I'm a weird perfectionist because I don't really work hard to make things perfect. Like I don't sit there and clean the dishes like a, you know, a normal, a good perfectionist would. <laughs> I just get mad at myself when it's not perfect, but I don't put the effort in. <laughs> so it's the worst kind of perfectionism. So I go to this place of self-doubt. And that makes me feel really ashamed. That thought of I'm not good enough brings me to a place of shame really easily. And when I feel ashamed, I get really, really angry because I don't like feeling ashamed. So now I'm on the offensive. I'm super, super angry. Then I react. Now it's really helpful when we're thinking about reactions to think of a character we turn into because it just humorizes the whole thing because it's kind of crazy what we do what we turn into. We're kind of messed up as humans. We do some really silly things. So for me, the character that I would say most describes me in those moments would be the Hulk. I just get so angry. I know I seem like I'm a really nice person, but I'm, I get very angry when I feel ashamed. That is like my biggest trigger. So now I'm this like raging lunatic. Now the outcome is that I think I'm the victim here. I'm being attacked. He said something mean to me. Meanwhile, I am absolutely the bully in this situation. I have this massive reaction and I turn into this really intense, unpleasant character. So that is a very common pattern that comes up for me in lots of different places. That's a really simple example of it. So in order to help your kids, and what we're going for is to create a home environment where we can have these lighthearted, funny conversations about our patterns. That's the goal. Because if we can do that in the home, it means your child, wherever they are in the world, whatever's happening to them, they can see what they're doing. They can take accountability for what's happening and what part they're playing in it in a way that's lighthearted. Oh, okay, right. I messed up. I did something silly. Okay, like I can see it, and if I can see it, then I can change it. But if I'm so ashamed to even look at it, and I can't even talk about it, then I'm probably never really gonna change it. So this is what we're trying to do. So to do that, we wanna know how to do that for ourselves. So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes, and I would like you to turn to the person next to you and I would like you to talk them through one of your patterns. So we're practicing that vulnerability. See if you can come up with the character that you turn into. See if you can turn it into a bit of a joke. So it's not a heavy conversation, but just a lighthearted conversation about how silly we are as humans. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to have that conversation with the person next to you. Okay, we'll wrap that up. You're so calm and quiet compared to the teachers. <laughs> they were yelling. I had to yell at them to get them to be quiet. <laughs> Amazing.
Amazing. Thank you for jumping into that conversation. So this kind of a conversation, maybe you have these kind of conversations all the time. If you do, amazing. For most of us, this is a, a different kind of a conversation than one we usually have. We don't usually talk about our own patterns because it's embarrassing. And if we're talking about anyone's patterns, we're probably talking about your patterns <laughs> because you're the one that's making me angry. And so just having this open reflection with your child, and I really encourage you to engage with them in it. So one of the things I used to do a lot with parents and kids is if we're teaching this skill to a child or to a teenager, if they can see that you're willing to do it too, and you're showing them, yeah, I also, you know, when you yell at me and you slam your door and you get mad at me for, you know, not being a good enough parent, that really hurts my feelings. And I do some things that are not so helpful too. So it just helps when you're trying to help them understand what they're doing that's not helpful, to see that it's everybody in the situation probably reacting in not a great way. Even if your reaction is a result of their reaction, that's okay. It's just a way to talk about the challenge in a way that's less accusatory. So, oh look, that thing happened where I turned into a monster and you turned into a mouse or whatever it is. Okay, we did that thing again. That's all right, we're human. But if we can keep seeing it, and this is how behavior change happens, we see it and we see it and we see it and it sucks during the time when we see it and we can't change it. <laughs> That's not a pretty time. But we see it and we see it and we see it after. And then maybe we see it like a week later and we go, oh yeah, you're right. Finally, I'm not angry with you anymore and I can see that maybe you had a point. And then maybe once we see it more and more, we can see it after a couple of days, then we can see it after a couple hours, and then eventually we can see it in the moment. And we can go, oh my goodness, I'm in it. And then sometimes you're in the middle of a fight and you just burst out laughing because you realize how silly it is. That's what we're aiming for. We're not aiming for perfection. We're not aiming to get rid of this. We're human. We're going to have these. It doesn't matter where in the journey we are, but the point is the moment when we notice. If we notice in the moment, if we notice a week later or a year later, it doesn't matter. As long as we notice, because if we notice, we can start to change things. So that's the skill that you want to help your child with. Notice. What do I do that's not so helpful? And how can I not beat myself up out over it? Okay, so this is the kind of thing you can ask your child. If something happened that they're upset about, you map it out with them. Okay, so what happened? That's usually the, qu the question that we're used to asking. What happened? But then we want to go further. What did you think? What were you thinking in that moment? When this happened, what thoughts were in your mind? How did you feel? What did you do? And what was the outcome? And I used to do this in therapy sessions with kids a lot. You literally write it down. Because if you write it down, then you go, okay, what parts of that do you have the control over to change? Not what happened. We can't do anything about that. But how we think, yes. Not how we feel, but we can react differently, what we do. Two things there we have control over, our thoughts and our actions. So if we map it out, we can start to say, okay, what if we change that? What if we had a different thought? Then what would happen? And then what would that result in? What feeling would come? What action would come? Or what if we did something different? What if we walked away? Then what would happen? What outcome would it be? So it's about understanding the behavior chain, behavior chain that happens in the situation. And that is very empowering. Because again, we can't control the things that happen to us, but when it comes to resilience, if we know how to respond and we know how to change our response when we do something that's not so helpful, that's very powerful. Okay, the next stage is effort. This is a really important part of resilience. We can't become resilient if other people are doing things for us. We have to do it ourselves. So this is like the tree pushing up out of the ground. It takes a tremendous amount of effort. So I just want to tell you a little story about a situation, a traumatic situation that happened outside of school a long time ago. These kinds of things don't happen anymore, luckily. But in California, in the 60s or 70s, there was a school bus full of children that were kidnapped outside of a school. 
And they were brought to an underground quarry, and then they were left there. And they were terrified, of course, but one of the children, it was an elementary school, so they were all quite young, the oldest was about 12, and one of the children figured out how to dig themselves out to safety. So he dug them out of the quarry, they all got to safety, and they were all physically unharmed, which is fantastic. But they were all terrified, and they all had PTSD symptoms, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, which is very, very natural in a situation like that. So they were terrified, they weren't sleeping, they were having nightmares, they were wetting the bed, they didn't want to get on a bus again, they didn't want to go to school, it was really, really scary for them. But one child in that situation did not have those impacts. And that child was the one that dug them to safety. Now, it doesn't always happen like this. Trauma impacts are varied and lots of different things can happen from them. But the thing to remember in that situation, it's a good learning experience for all of us. Because what happens when hard things, when traumatic things happen, is that we experience a loss of control. That's why things are hard. When something happens to us or around us that feels like it's out of our control, that's what feels traumatic. And the reason why it impacts us is not because we go through it, it's because we start to think the world is a scary place or I can't cope. That's the thought pattern that comes out of it. Or for me, I'm not good enough. That's a thought that can't, comes out of hard situations. I can't cope comes out of hard situations. So this is the thought that comes up when we lose control in a situation. And so we learn, this is the challenge with trauma, anything hard. Trauma just meaning anything hard we go through where we feel a loss of control. We learn. And so all of those kids learned that something scary could happen where they lose control of where they are, of their safety. But what that one boy learned is not that scary things can happen and I can't cope, what he learned is that even if the scariest thing happens, I can help myself and I can help other people. So he learned that he's basically Superman. That's his learning out of that. So this is the cool part about action. So that story is used just to help highlight the importance of doing something to help ourselves when we're in a hard situation. If we can do something for ourselves, for someone else, we don't have the same things that we carry from the hard things we go through. It's a really beautiful part of going through hard things, is that we find our strength. But we have to do something, we have to act. So this is what we want to do. When young people, when your children are going through something hard, we have to help them try, help them do something for themselves. So we can ask questions like, what can you do to help yourself in this situation? What's one small step? So they don't have to fix it for themselves. They don't have to solve it all in one day. It's way more helpful if it's a tiny step because if we can take a tiny step that's manageable, we start to feel like we have agency again. We start to feel like I have power, and then we can take the next step, and then the next step. But if we don't take any steps, we never realize our power. Equally, if we push our kids too much to do something that's way too much for them and take way too big of a step, then they feel paralyzed. So it's all about the tiny, tiny steps. So how can I help you face this? So we're there for them, we're supporting them, but at the end of the day, because remember, the challenge comes from their own feeling. Whatever the hard thing is they're facing, it's a feeling that's coming up. So only they can face their own feeling. So how can I help you face this? And it's really important as well to remember, and I'm sure all of you know this and remind yourselves of this, a lot of kids need you to do it with them. And they need you to do it with them for a lot longer than you imagine they might. And that's okay. Scaffolding. 
So if it's something that you think you should know this already, that's okay to have that thought. And that might be an indication that they need a little bit more guidance, a little bit more support. So it's okay to do it with them, but not for them. That's a really big distinction. So what we're trying to do is help them identify an action they can take. So we are a coach, not a rescuer. We're on the sidelines. They're in the game. They're the one doing it. We can coach them, we can guide them, we can offer support and advice, but we can't swoop in and score the goal for them. It's a really important distinction and it's hard because if you know you can do it very quickly and easily and they're struggling to do it, it's really hard to stand back. But that's a really important piece of it. So the standing back and then also the practicing of moving forward. So when we think about that, and it's really helpful again, I always like to use our own examples. Because if we're asking people to do something, if we are doing it ourselves, we have a lot more empathy and understanding of how hard it is. And then we're a lot better at coaching. So when we're thinking about helping our kids take a step, do something to help themselves, the best thing we can do is practice doing that for ourselves. Take a moment and think about where's an area that I'm maybe not helping myself and how can I take a little step there? And it's something that we don't often have time for in our lives and we have so many things going on, but just taking that little bit of time. So we're gonna do a little exercise where we think about that here tonight. So I want you to think of something that you're avoiding or something that scares you. So it could be an awkward conversation, it could be some form of self-care that you know is good for you but you don't necessarily have time for. It could be anything you want that you're just not doing for yourself. So I'll give you an example. So I am pregnant, I'm five months pregnant, and my mother-in-law wants to come for the birth attend at the birth and <laughs> and I don't want her to attend at the birth <laughs> but I'm terrified to tell her that because I don't want to offend her and she probably will get offended and I'm telling myself all these stories about how awful it's going to be <laughs> and I'm feeling really invaded and it's this whole thing going on in my mind and she has no idea <laughs> she's just blissfully unaware like oh this is going to be so great so I'm avoiding that because I'm a people pleaser and it terrifies me to set a boundary. So I'm avoiding that. Now, when we're avoiding something, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is something that you wanna be teaching your kids. The longer you put off your homework, the bigger of a task it's gonna seem. The longer we wait to do something, the longer we wait to tell someone the truth, the bigger the lie gets. So this is a really important lesson, and it's important for all of us to recognize that we all do some version of this. It's really helpful to be there with your kids. So the smallest step. So for me, the smallest step I could take is just to actually write down what I want to say. Just get it clear in my mind so that I'm clear, so that when I go into the conversation, I don't feel so just overwhelmed. So that's a, a really small step I could take. But it's not good enough just to think of that step. I have to also figure out when am I going to do that step? Where am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? How am I going to hold myself accountable? Because I know this and I still haven't done it. So I have to declare when I'm going to do this. And I talked about it yesterday and I still didn't do it. So this time I'm going to declare I will write this before I get home and I'm getting home tomorrow. So I'm declaring to all of you that I will do this before I get home tomorrow. Because if we don't do that, if we don't help ourselves with a little step and hold ourselves accountable, that's when we start feeling more and more out of control. So it's a really simple way to regain a sense of agency. And we also gain a sense of self-esteem, and this is important when you're thinking about your kids. We build self-esteem through tiny, tiny moments and promises that we keep with ourselves. If I say I'm going to do something for myself, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go for a walk in the morning, and then I get up and I go for that walk, I start to see myself as someone who takes care of myself. 
someone who's trustworthy, someone who follows through, someone who knows what they want and goes for it. That is a lot of things to take from just a simple act of going for a walk. So it all starts with figuring out what is something that I'm not doing for myself and what is one small step I can take and then how do I take it? So practicing this skill for yourself will really help you in terms of coaching your children with it. So I wanna give you just a minute and I want you to either write something down or think of it or talk to the person next to you about something you're avoiding or that scares you and the smallest step and when and how and where are you going to do that step. I'll just give you a minute for that. Okay, fantastic. So, I really encourage you to take that one little step, as silly as it seems, as silly as it might be, to take that little step and that's role modeling for your child. That's role modeling what they need to learn how to do. And so just notice how you responded to that. It's so interesting what we do. So I'm really good at talking. <laughs> I have a struggle with the follow through. You might have avoided even thinking about it altogether when I asked you to do that exercise. No judgments, it's just noticing. What do we do? How do we respond? Do we take care of ourselves? Do we do things that are uncomfortable but good for us? Because the more honest we can be with ourselves, the more we can encourage our child to be honest. And if they're being honest with themselves and they're putting in effort, that's resilience. Okay, beautiful. So the last step is the beautiful flowering of the tree, acceptance. This is where we wish our kids would be all the time, in a state of acceptance. Accepting the rules we've set, accepting the challenges that face them, accepting themselves, accepting us. Acceptance is a beautiful, beautiful outcome and it's a beautiful thing to strive for. But it's also very challenging. And it's important to remember this is the last step. This is the top of the tree. You have to grow the tree first. So you can't reach a state of self-acceptance, of accepting others, of accepting the world, unless you've sat with your feelings and you reflected on your patterns and you've taken steps to help yourself, then you can be in a state of acceptance because they go hand in hand. You can't accept something that you don't know and understand. You can't accept something that you don't feel. And if you're not putting in the effort to help yourself, you know that. And there's a part of you that will resist accepting yourself because we know deep down, we always know. And when it comes to your child's mental health, what's really important to know and remember is that at the heart of every mental health challenge, there's gonna be a layer of a struggle with acceptance because that's part of it. So if we want things to be different for whatever reason, because they're hard, because they're challenging, that's depression and apathy, right? We want things to be different so we feel depressed. If we want to be different, that's body image challenges, that's eating struggles. If we don't trust ourselves, others, life, lack of acceptance of the things around us, that's anxiety and stress. And what's really important to know is that these are all really common in all of us. We all go through times where we're anxious and stressed. That's probably the one I struggle with the most. Depression and apathy often comes after the stress. We get really, really stressed and then we crash. You know, body image and eating struggles is something that most young people go through. Most adults go through that. So it's okay if your child is struggling with these things. There's nothing wrong with that. And the way you can help them is all of these tools that we're talking about. And acceptance is, is the last one. So really helping them see the difference between emotions and perspective. So we're, we do a lot with connecting to emotions. We talked about that a lot. We also have to help them zoom out. So when we're in an emotion, we have no perspective. So this is what's really important about helping them soothe and connect to their feeling when they're in the moment so that when it's past, we can think about things again. Because if we decide everything, or we think everything, and we believe everything when we're in that emotion, 
we're going to be thinking things that are not that helpful. So it's remembering for us too, when you see your child stressed or overwhelmed or saying things and you go, this is not true for you. I know this is not true. Just help yourself remember and then help them remember. Let's just take a breath. Let's think about this again tomorrow. Let's think about this again after we've calmed down a little bit. Really important tool. And really just reminding them that it's okay to be who they are, where they are. That's a, such a powerful thing you can tell your child. Every child is unique. Every child will have different challenges, different things that they're going through, and they will feel different on some level. And they probably will feel not good enough on some level because that's human. And so just to consistently be that reinforcing element, it's okay if you're behind in this. It's okay if you feel you know, different from your peers or lacking in a certain way. It's okay, you're okay how you are. It doesn't mean you don't put in the effort. It doesn't mean we don't try and we don't strive, but we also don't think that we're less than. And if you can keep reinforcing that, that's very, very powerful. Helps them accept themselves. Really helping them, and this is a big one in this age of social media that we live in, the difference between striving for a joyful life and for a happy life is very, very different. So happiness is a fleeting emotion. We feel happy, sure. We also feel sad. We can never feel happy all the time. But when we look online, we see only the happy images, usually, other than the, the scary accounts where we see only the intense <laughs> images. But we see this image of perfection and happiness and that isn't helpful for any of us. So reminding your child that joy is something we do. It's an act. We can be joyful in our sadness. We can be joyful in the struggle because being joyful means being in the moment, experiencing things to the fullest. Sometimes when we're sad and we go through something hard, we're the most present. We appreciate the world around us because it's so poignant. So really helping to encourage them that they don't need to be happy all the time. It's okay if they have a down day or a down week or they're struggling. Just reminding them of that. We need to be reminded of that all the time. As adults, we do. I need to be reminded of that when I'm sad. So kids need to remind of that over and over again. It's okay not to be happy all the time. We don't need to strive for that. And then again, the role modeling. So powerful. Self-acceptance is a practice. It is really hard to accept ourselves and to accept others. It's not something that comes easily to us as humans. So we need to role model that. So I wanna guide you through just one last exercise to just highlight this practice and see what comes up for you. So I'd love you to close your eyes again if you feel comfortable. And I would like you to think of someone that you really don't like. Someone that frustrates you or angers you. And it could be someone you personally know. It could be someone from your past. It could also be a public figure or someone in the media. So anyone that just riles you up. And I want you to think of their worst flaw the thing that is the most hurtful or unacceptable about them, the thing that just really, really isn't okay with you. And I want you to ask yourself the question, can I accept this person just as they are, even if they never change. And just notice how that feels. It doesn't mean you will have them in your life. It doesn't mean that you ever want to see them again. It doesn't mean that you don't set a boundary with them or you don't say some harsh things to them. It doesn't mean any of that. But it means, can I accept the fact that I cannot control them? <coughs> that they are who they are, and I can't change that. Now, I want you to think of yourself 
and your own worst flaw. The thing about yourself that you're the most ashamed of. You just wish you could hide that maybe you don't tell people about a way that you see yourself, something that you really wish you could change. And I want you to ask yourself, can I accept myself just as I am with this flaw, even if I never change? Can I love myself anyway without trying to fix myself, without beating myself up, without giving up on myself or making this a project that I have to fix? Doesn't mean you have to like that quality of yourself, but can you accept it and love it because it's part of who you are? <coughs> And just notice what that feels like. Okay, when you're ready, just take a deep breath and you can slowly open your eyes. Okay, so that is a really helpful little tool to just show you where your edges are. You might have found that really easy I don't find either of those easy at all. I find it most hard, the self-acceptance part. You might find accepting others more hard. But the purpose of that is to have a little self-compassion, to recognize that it's hard to be human. It's hard to be a parent. It's hard to be alive with all of these challenges. And your child will face those challenges too. And the most important thing you can do is keep that perspective of, I get you and I get this is hard and I want to help coach you, but none of us are perfect and that's okay. And so what you're trying to role model is that accountability. Okay, I can see that I have a flaw or I can see that I really don't like what that person's doing. There's an accountability. They're doing something that's not okay. But we're also more than our patterns. That person that you hate is more than that thing about them than you hate. You are more than your pattern. Your child is more than when they're acting out. You know that, and that's what we're trying to instill in them. And it's a practice. And so that's what we're trying to teach. And so the more you can practice that yourself, you will just organically pass that on to your children. And the more you can coach them in that, the better. So as a summary, in the moment, we talked about four things. Now, you're not going to necessarily remember all those four things when you're in the moment, and that's okay. It's not about getting it perfect. It's about having a few tools and seeing if you can use them from time to time. And when you forget to use them, we go back and use them later. It's completely fine. So you're in the heat of the moment. Your child does something that frustrates you. You forget everything and you yell at them. This is human. But then we can go back and we can go, okay, I wanna own what just happened. I wanna, I wanna do this differently. Let's now talk about what happened. Let's talk about how that felt for you. Let's talk about our patterns. So we can always go back to it. And I really encourage you, when things go in a way that you're not proud of or you don't like, always come back to it with your child. Open it up again. Don't be scared to have that conversation again, even if it brings up those strong emotions again, because that's so helpful for them to see, oh right, okay, we don't have to get it perfect, but we can still take accountability. That's beautiful. So in the moment, here are some little strategies. So something intense happens, we just name it. I'm getting a bit intense. Whew, something's happening. That's the pattern we're noticing. What do you need right now? That's a beautiful way to ask your child about their feelings because then it helps them look inward. That's what we're trying to do with feelings. How do I look inward? What do I need? What's one step we can take? That's the effort. And then, I'm so proud of you for trying. That's all anyone can do, acceptance. So this is just a simple way that these four steps can go into a conversation, into a moment of intensity. And we can use just one, we can use them all, we can jump into them, so there's no right way to do this. 
The goal here is just to give you some strategies, give you a framework, and hopefully just reinforce some of the things you're doing, maybe add a few things to your toolbox. And most importantly, just remind you that in terms of parenting, you being present, you caring, and you focusing on your child's internal world, these are the most important ingredients. And so if you're showing up with that intention, you're helping them so much more than you ever could possibly know. So I just want to finish with just letting you know, and you might know this already, but we do, we have made resources, as Maura said, um, the district is working with Open Parachute, which is our school-based content. There are also resources for parents. So that's a short link. You can go to that link. It's the one that's specific to your district. And there's a whole series of resources. These are just a few of them that have sort of deep content on different topic areas that your child might be facing. So whether it's peer challenges, whether it's things online, whether it's struggling with mental health challenges, um, the goal here is to just give you some of the information that you'd get if you went to see a clinical psychologist and some step-by-step -step tools of what does this mean, how do I respond to this, um, and we're going to also be adding to those resources as time goes on, so you can keep checking back in there. But I really encourage you to make use of that. That's available to you anytime you want to access that. So thank you so much for, for being here and for your time. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them or else have a really lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you.